Our scripture this evening is from 2 Kings, the 13th chapter, verses 14 through 25. 2 Kings 13, verses 14 through 25. Our subject is the fear of victory, the fear of victory. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hadst consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that, behold, they spied a band of men. And they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. But Hazael, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. And the Lord was gracious unto them and had compassion on them and had respect unto them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, neither cast he them from his presence as yet. So Hazael, king of Syria, died, and Ben-Hadad his son reigned in his stead. And Jehoash the son of Jehoahaz took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad the son of Hazael the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz, his father, by war. Three times did Joash beat him and recovered the cities of Israel. We have here a remarkable setting. The old prophet is dying. Young King Joash comes to see the dying prophet. This is a real tribute to Elisha. For 63 years he had been a prophet to Israel. Moreover, the king uses the very words concerning him that Elisha had used for Elijah. O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Joash, like all the men of Israel, was a man who professed to believe in the Lord. He recognized Elisha as indeed a man of God. He did profess to be a believer in the Lord. But like all the men of Israel, he was a syncretist. He combined his faith with alien doctrines. He had at all times a divided loyalty. 
He served God in so far as it was convenient and advantageous to himself. Elisha ordered the young king to shoot off an arrow. And he put his hands on Joash's hands as he shot, as a symbol of God's help in the war against the Syrians. He said thereby the king's war against the Syrians would be the prophet's war and more the war of God against Syria. But then he asked him to do something more, and the meaning was not lost on Joash. Shoot into the ground. This meant to him, because symbolism was basic to the life of the Hebrew peoples, the defeat of Syria. You will drive them into the ground. He had a quiver full of arrows. He shot three times only. And the dying prophet was angry. Why? Why did not Joash want full victory? Why did he not empty his entire quiver into the ground, ensuring full and total defeat against Syria? For a century now, Syria had been embarked in war. War every few years against Israel. Why? There were two ideas of foreign policy that prevailed in that whole area, that part of the Middle East at that time. The great power of the day was Assyria. Assyria, little by little, was consolidating its power and encompassing one kingdom after another, one of the greatest military powers in all of history. Everyone knew that sooner or later Assyria was going to move against Syria, Israel, Judah, Philistia, Edom, every one of those kingdoms, and take Egypt. There were two theories as how to meet that threat. One was, let us have an alliance. All of us little powers should get together in a grand alliance. And then, as allies, we will have a combined power that will enable us to meet the Assyrian threat. This was the foreign policy of Israel. It goes back before Ahab to Ahab's father, Omri. And it probably was not original with him, but borrowed from one of his predecessors. But the prophets had opposed this. Elijah had opposed it, and Elisha. Why? Because alliances are like marriages. They require a unity of faith and life between the two countries that make them. And the standpoint of the Lord and of the prophets was, can two walk together unless they are agreed? An alliance was also a religious alliance as well as military. But all the kings of Israel continually sought that kind of alliance. On the other hand, the policy of Syria was an alliance is too uncertain. When the chips are down, how can we be sure that all these various little powers will fight with us? Perhaps they will decide at the last moment to make terms with Assyria and sell us out. And with Assyria coming at us from one direction 
and Israel on the other direction. What if Israel sells us out? We had better take over Israel. When in Ahab's day, Syria moved against Israel, it had already consolidated 32 little countries as a means of meeting Assyria, and it wanted to consolidate into its empire Israel as well. Thus, we had two foreign policies then. Imperialism on the one hand as the answer to a great empire, the terror of Syria and its oppression as a means of meeting a greater oppression, and the other, a mutual defense pact which would have meant the surrender of faith, the surrender of integrity. Israel never thought of the alternative that the prophets commended to it as required by the word of God. That alternative was that they stand alone in terms of God. The Lord God of Israel is greater, the prophets made clear, than Assyria or Syria. And again and again, the Lord demonstrated his power by giving them victory over Syria. But still, they preferred their way. Joash, you see, got the point. If I empty my whole quiver into the ground, it means the obliteration of Syria. But our foreign policy is one of defeating Syria enough to persuade Syria that we must have a peace treaty and a mutual defense pact. Ahab made one with Ben-Hadad after he defeated him, and it lasted only as long as it took Ben-Hadad time to get back to his capital. Sounds like our State Department today, does it not? We're going to meet the threat of the Soviet Union by a worldwide system of pacts, NATO and CETO and so on, not by faith. And the result is our systems crumble and we become more and more impotent as we face the problem. Joash did not want an all-out victory over Syria because it would have brought it face to face with Assyria. Well, why? Why, when he knew, as Elisha had made clear and has been made clear before, going back to Ahab's day, a couple of generations back and more, that God could give the victory. Why not? He wanted to keep Syria alive as a buffer state and as an ally. But even more, he was afraid of victory. Afraid of victory? Why? Well, the fear of victory is not an unusual thing. Let's look at it very concretely in terms of a very homely, everyday fact. When I was in the pastorate, I did a great deal of hospital visitation. But I always found that among the sick, not all by any means, there were always some whose sickness was an escape. They didn't want help. Why wouldn't a person want help? For a very obvious reason. If you're healthy and able, you have to meet your problems. 
And if you have problems you're running away from, problems you do not want to face, why then you become sick. Very simple. What can you do about your problems if you're chronically sick? One girl I went to school with, her mother was always ailing. And the worst thing you could say if you ever went there was, well, you're looking very well today, Mrs. Blank. That made her furious. Furious. She spent her life evading responsibility. You see, people are unwilling to meet responsibilities. And so in one way or another, countless people cripple themselves physically and spiritually to avoid meeting life victoriously and having the responsibilities and having victory. Now let's go back to Joash. He could have had victory if he followed exactly what Elisha wanted him to do. But if he did that, he would have had to say, I must trust not in myself, nor in my righteousness, nor in my way, nor in my foreign policy, but in the Lord. And if I put my life on the line with the Lord, I must believe and obey him on his terms. Now, many people don't like that. I recall a good many years ago, this one church officer who was very, very furious every time he took the offering. That was one of his responsibilities every Sunday. This young convert, an ex-Marine, who had never been inside of a church before and whose life had really been a messy thing when he came back from the service. But through a disaster of a fearful sort, he was shaken to his foundations and became a Christian, and he took it seriously. And he sat in the very front row every Sunday morning, and he put in his tithe. And the man who took the offering was furious about it, and he said, what's he trying to do? Make me feel badly? Give me a guilty conscience? You see, people don't want to be reminded of their responsibilities. And Joash knew, if I take victory from the hand of God, it comes with a price. It comes with my total commitment. And I like my way of life better. I like my diplomacy, my reasoning. Fullness of victory from the Lord involved the fullness of faith, of surrender, and of obedience. Men are afraid to trust God wholly and to obey God wholly. Why? Because they know that when they do so, that God claims them totally. And for men like Joash, This meant defeat, a worse defeat than at the hands of the Syrians. It would have meant a defeat of his pride. It would have meant a defeat of his independence, his autonomy from God. It would have meant a defeat of his right to sin, to choose his own way of life. meant he would no longer be the master of his fate and captain of his soul, but that the Lord would be. 
And his feeling was, I must be the sovereign. I must decide and control in my life, not God. He recognized that the Lord says, I give victory, but I must rule. The price of victory is faith, surrender, obedience. Readiness to receive all from the Lord and to give our all to the Lord. Therefore, deliberately, Joash let this opportunity for victory slip. But God still offered victory a little later in the bones of Elisha, which gave life when in the course of a skirmish a man was killed and the men were in retreat, they opened the sepulcher and dropped the body in. When he touched the bones of Elisha, the man came to life. It was a witness to Joash. This is the way and this is the life to yield yourself to the Lord. And even to the dead bones of Israel, life will come. At the eleventh hour, the God of Elisha was still ready. But Joash wanted no part of victory at the price that God required. You see, God here very clearly sets forth a fact that is true in all times. When we bring of our substance to the Lord, the Lord requires a tithe, a tenth. But when we bring of ourselves, God is not content with a tithe. He wants all of us. Joash was ready to call on the name of the Lord, ready to weep when the prophet of God was dying, ready to praise him and call him the strength of Israel, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the strength thereof. The Lord will not be content with a tithe of our life or obedience. He only accepts all of it. To be victorious in the Lord means losing our life and our own control of ourselves to the Lord. And I submit that even as with Joash, this is the problem in our lives and in the life of the church today. Like Joash, we have a fear of victory. Again and again, the scriptures declare what God will give unto his people, what God promises to his saints, what God says will come to pass when his church is in very truth his church. Not even the gates of hell can hold out against it. We become more than conquerors through him that loved us. What then is the problem? We don't want to be more than conquerors because it means God conquers us. And we prefer to have God as a helper and not as Lord as an insurance agent providing fire and life insurance rather than our God. Are we afraid of victory? Are we afraid to commit our life unreservedly from the Lord? If we are afraid, then we are running away from victory. 
Our Lord says very definitely, he that findeth his life, that is, seeks to control it, to advance it in terms of his determination, shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. This, then, is one of the sadder stories of Scripture. And a story that fits our time. Fifty million to fifty-five million born-again adults, according to a poll taken last year. 50 to 55 million professing Christians who say they are born again. Then where is the power? Where is the victory? Where is the conquest of these who should be more than conquerors? Have they been ready to surrender their life to the Lord and be governed by him. Let's go back to the illustration I used earlier. People who are afraid of health, who choose sickness to escape responsibility. What happens to them? Well, most pastors have had experience with such. They wind up as lifelong neurotics unable to face up to anything. And what happens to churches and Christians who are unwilling to become victorious in the Lord, unwilling to lose their life in Him? Why, they wind up as sickly churches and Christians, fretful, murmuring against pastors and officers, murmuring against this and that because basically their discontent is with themselves and with the Lord. An unwillingness to come to terms with what God requires of them. The life of Elijah is a mighty witness to what can be done when a servant of the Lord becomes God's possession to be used by him. And Elisha witnesses on his deathbed to the impotence of a half-hearted faith. God summons us, therefore, out of the impotence of our ways into the power of a faith that gives God the glory. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, give us grace that day by day we may yield ourselves totally unto Thee, believing obeying, serving without reservation, rejoicing in victory, knowing that in Christ we are more than conquerors, and this is the victory which overcometh the world, even our faith. Wean us, O Lord, from a fear of health, a fear of victory, Wean us, O Lord, from our desire to have our way, so that with our Lord we may say, Not our will, but thine be done. Then send us forth in thy power, that we may go forth as Christian soldiers, bringing every area of life and thought into captivity to Christ, our King. In his name we pray.
Amen. For some strange reason, it took a look at the questions to get moving. It's bypassed that first 15 minutes <laughs> last night. Yeah, good. Minute 16. Who's first? Uh, yeah. There was some mention last night uh, about the involvement into uh, Eastern religion. I find this is running rampant in my particular area, even with adults. Now, I've used, now I have not heard about it before, and I've also used, uh, did you give up Jesus Christ? And I can't seem to get any further with any of the people. Yes. I'd like to know what, what kind of biblical background you could give me off the top of your head, if possible. To fight this yeah. The question is with regard to the increasing prevalence of interest in Eastern religions. Now, I'm very glad to have that question asked because it's very much related to what we were just talking about. What is the essence of Eastern religion? Well, uh, there have been philosophical analyses of them. One of the most interesting was by Schweitzer, who certainly was not an Orthodox Christian. And these analyses have agreed essentially on this point, that whereas biblical faith has a world and life view that affirms the world and life. Eastern religions uniformly deny the world and life. They represent a kind of defeatism and escapism so that people who go into these Eastern religions are really seeking an escape from the world and from problems. What the Eastern religions essentially say is that all things are meaningless. There is no meaning except the purely personal. Therefore, nothing really matters you withdraw from the world and from problems and you seek a peace by saying it's all nothing. Now, at the heart of Eastern religions is a belief in ultimate nothingness. My approach to people who go into these cults is perhaps brutal, but I think it's honest. I tell them, it's a cop-out. You're a coward. You're running away from life into a faith that refuses to face up to the world and to problems and which is, in essence, a suicidal faith. So you're a coward. Now, nobody likes to be called that. But I find it's the only way I can shake them up because what they do is to retreat into a shell. They want to forsake all human associations and any ties that will uh, have a hold upon them or a claim upon them into an autonomy of uh, real selfishness, but a, a supposed selflessness. Now, there was a question that was asked of me just before we began, and I think I'll go into that now because it ties in with this same time we have the very extensive cult of love and we are told that as Christians we really should be a part of this love movement and of course these Eastern religions because they become withdrawn and pacifistic and nothing is worth fighting for whether in the personal sense or in the military sense you surrender everything they claim that it's because they're filled with love. 
But if there's anything that's lacking in the Far East, it is love. For example, in the Orient, you do not save a man's life because you are then responsible for their life, the rest of their life, and they expect you to support them. You saved me, didn't you? Life is a mystery. You brought them back. You saved them from drowning. Therefore, you take care of me for the rest of my life. Love in the Orient becomes a total negation of action, a negation of any affection for anyone. It's just withdrawal and passivity. Moreover, love in the Bible is not this antinomian, that is, anti-law, emotionalism. In fact, love in the Bible does not have to do with emotion so much as with God's word. We are told emphatically in Romans 13, Verse 8, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And then it goes on to say, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other uh, commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Now the word fulfill here means put into force, put into action, make a part of life. So what is love in the biblical sense? Well, that means that thou shalt not kill. I respect my neighbors and my enemies' right to life. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I respect the sanctity of his home. Thou shalt not steal. I respect his property. Thou shalt not bear false witness. I respect his good name. Thou shalt not covet. I do not seek to defraud him because the biblical word covet has in essence the meaning of to defraud whether legally or otherwise. How do I love my neighbor? Why, by keeping the law in relationship to him. I may not like him, but I love him in the biblical sense if I obey the law in relationship to him. So, biblical love is a positive thing. It means that I seek to maintain God's law as a fence around my neighbor as well as myself. And that there is no better way to love my neighbor than in terms of God's law. Just as there is no better way to love my wife than in terms of God's law. This is why whenever I've been faced with a situation where a man or a woman is adulterous and they say, but I love him or I love her, and I say, you don't. Because the love is the fulfilling of the law. If you had any love, you wouldn't do that. Now that's scriptural. But what does the Eastern cultist say about love? It's passivity. I sit there and I say, I love everybody. And I let the world go to hell. I do nothing about anything. It's a passivity that is based on cowardice and a cop-out. Well, that's a pretty strong statement, but that's how I feel about the subject. Any other questions? Yes? So totally what paradise is, what heaven is. Could you? Yes, could you explain what paradise is, what heaven is, and does the Bible say specifically what happens to a person when they die, like where their soul is? The question is with regard to paradise and heaven and 
our state after death. Now, the Bible is different from all other religions in that it says very, very little about the world to come and the life to come. Because the thing that marks the Bible is that God speaks not to satisfy our curiosity, but to tell us what we need to know in order to live in terms of his word, his will, his purpose. So we are told very little about the world to come, but we are told this. Now, the word paradise means really garden. It's a very, very ancient word. It goes back to the ancient Persian. Uh, it goes back to ancient Armenian. It, you find it in all the languages of that part of the world. And it has to do with not only the original, the Garden of Eden, but also the new creation. So the new creation, as well as the Garden of Eden, are set forth as paradise. Heaven is the abode of those who have died and are with the Lord today so that those who have passed on are with the Lord, their souls are in heaven. At the end of the world, there will be the resurrection of the dead, and they will again have a physical being in the new creation. Now, when we die, we are, according to Scripture, instantly with the Lord. There is no such thing as soul sleep in Scripture. Over and over again, it's made clear that those who die are with the Lord. And, of course, the famous verse that is uh, debated by those who go for soul sleep is that when our Lord said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, that today doesn't belong to our Lord's word there. Our Lord said today, they say. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous, and it is grammatically uh, an impossible construction. Our Lord told the thief that that very day they would be together in paradise because the new creation began when our Lord rose from the dead. Now, the fullness of that new creation is with the second coming so that the fullness and the reality of paradise will begin then. But we are today, all of us, members of the new creation because when we are Christians, we are removed from the old humanity of Adam and we now are members of the new humanity, Jesus Christ. So we have a double citizenship. We are citizens of this world but we are citizens of heaven, of the kingdom of God. So that while the words paradise and heaven and uh, the household of uh, God refer to heaven and the new creation, more often heaven refers to that period between beginning of time and the second coming and the new creation the new heavens and a new earth in their fullness begin after the second coming does that help I started hearing about and I it wasn't fitting in there what I had been taught before and I was confused so yeah. yes it did Yes. I was not here last night, and uh, participation and focus upon that portion. I understand that uh, from what little I have heard about what happened last night, that uh, it had to do with the construction of other Christian churches, not only the Jews, but other Christian churches as far as the gifts of tongue. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but what I would like is a slight brief, if you did the couple of sentences, a brief synopsis, synopsis of what uh, uh, you feel about 
gifts of tongues and the spiritual gifts. Yes. Well, may I suggest that you either talk to Pastor Chilton right here afterwards, or that part was put on tape separately, and you can purchase it, because I do feel it's important for you to get not just a synopsis, if there are any questions in your mind on the subject, but the whole of that tape. It can be purchased from, uh, well, I believe it's in the back table, and I think you'll find it an excellent statement by Mr. Chilton of what the scripture has to teach on the subject. So I hope you don't mind, but I do feel it's important for you to get the whole argument. Yes. Different subject, but the same passage in 1 Corinthians 14, 21. Paul, when he quotes Isaiah, refers to it as the law. Yeah. Now, I always thought the law was the Pentateuch and the prophets. They were two different things. What does he mean when he says the prophet Isaiah is the law? Yes, the question is in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 21. Paul quotes Isaiah, and he speaks of Isaiah as the law. The term law or Torah was used sometimes for only the law as we think of it, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, but most commonly for the whole of the Old Testament. Moreover, later on, the word law was used in the church for the whole of the Bible. Why? Because every word that God speaks is binding upon man. So it's all the law of God. This is why throughout the New Testament you will find that term. Now sometimes you'll find the law and the prophets, but very often just the law. And it will refer to the prophets or to the Psalms or to Proverbs, whatever. So the word of God is always law. It's the law word because law is the declaration of the Lord, of the sovereign. Yes. Uh, last night and tonight we, uh, well, you talked about the uh, antinomian heresy, I guess you call it. Is that in any way related to uh, the Arminian or our, our Arminian yes. heresy? <coughs> the question is, is the antinomian heresy in any way related to the Arminian heresy? Uh, the two are very often found together now, but it is not necessarily so related because antinomianism has sprung up in all circles. There have been reformed and are reformed men who are antinomian, and uh, there have been Arminians who have been anti-antinomian. Now, one of the great uh, theologians in the Wesleyan school was Watson. And Watson was very clearly hostile to antinomianism. Uh, Watson is still highly regarded, although not read, in Arminian circles. And if he were here today, he'd be horrified at what passes uh, under the name of Arminianism. He would reject it so that... Uh, we can't say that only the Arminians are antinomian. It's been a problem that's crept into all circles in recent years. After 1660, something that before was regarded as an abomination by all the uh, theologies silently crept into virtually all communion. Now, one reason for this was that various ideas of uh, spirituality crept in 
uh, that made people, as the old saying goes, so spiritually minded they were of no earthly good. And uh, in Catholic circles, it was the cult of the sacred heart and other things so that people were thinking about ecstatic experiences rather than uh, the Word of God. Throughout Protestantism, many forms of pietism became radically antinomian. One scholar, Stoffler, has recently written two volumes tracing the development of that in Germany. Now, he's not averse to it. He's just a scholar who's dealt with the subject. But uh, it crept in steadily, and in recent years it has become quite prominent, uh, partly as Modernism has also taken over various denominations because, of course, as faith in the infallible word breaks down, there also breaks down any trust in God's law as well as any faith in the cross. So you have a radical collapse. Yes. I may have made a comment that I knew it as it was, but I don't believe the definition. Yes. Uh, what is Arminianism? Well, Arminianism came to light within Reformed circles in the Netherlands as a result of the work of Jacob Arminius a Dutch theologian. In essence, what Arminianism was, was a Protestant revival of scholastic or Thomistic philosophy, the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. So it was a revival of a humanistic emphasis in theology as against the Reformation emphasis. Does that help clarify it? It's a big subject, Uh, One way to understand it, I was dealing the other night with the importance of justification, that Reformation theology emphasized justification, what God had done. Now, medieval scholasticism emphasized what man could do, and Arminianism also emphasized the same thing man's doing, so that in Arminianism the emphasis is on man rather than on God. And it talks about what man does in salvation rather than what God has done. So that Arminianism really was both anti-Luther and anti-Calvin. It was anti-Reformation in essence. Yes, I think you had a question. Or was yours the same? There was some. Yeah, you raised your hand. Yes. Uh, are there doctrines today, existing today, that uh, profess Arminianism? Is there any? That profess what? Uh, to be Arminian or. Oh, yes. Uh, Arminianism has crept into most circles, but of course, uh, your charismatics are predominantly Arminian. Uh, Many of your major Baptist groups are vehemently Arminian, but the great stronghold of Arminianism has been the Methodist or Wesleyan churches. They are the epitome of Arminianism. And it's significant that of all the major religious groups, it was the Wesleyan and Arminian that first went radically modernist. And then the last two that were infiltrated and affected were the uh, Lutheran and the Presbyterian circles, the Lutheran, the last major group to be infected. 
the first were the most Arminian. Arminians have an encapsulated uh, definition that, that uh, they believe that man was so good that he was worth saving. And I don't know if that's correct, but they've heard of the answer of man being good. They do not believe in total depravity, that's true. Moreover, they believe that man has a great deal to do with his own salvation so that man's decision is the critical thing in salvation rather than God's act through Christ. This is why justification is not stressed, you see, in Arminian circles. Yes? I'm very confused by people who claim to be Christian and have a belief in Jesus Christ and is their personal Savior, and yet feel that, I think you mentioned it the other night, they feel they have the liberty to do whatever they want because they're not under the law. Yes. I'm not sure this is a valid question, but what is their status? Are they Christian? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like the two of them go together. The question is, there are many people who claim to be uh, born again and that Jesus Christ is their, per is their personal Savior, but they believe they are under grace rather than under law, and their behavior is often in flagrant violation of God's Word. Are they Christian was the question. Well, it would be difficult to generalize with regard to all of them. Many of them are the products of bad teaching, and they respond very quickly when you point out to them that the Word of God does not say the law is dead, but that we are dead to the law as a handwriting of, indi of, uh, of uh, indictments, uh, uh, ordinances, a death penalty against us, but we're alive to it as the righteousness of God. And when we are redeemed, the, ta the law is written upon the tables of our hearts. Now, our Lord has given us a good yardstick for judging people. By their fruit shall ye know them. A good tree brings forth good fruit. A bad tree brings forth bad fruit. When I have someone telling me they're born again and yet they're a homosexual, which has happened, I know they're not a Christian because Scripture forbids me to believe that a good tree can bring forth bad fruit. <coughs> yes? I work with uh, Christians who are charismatic Christians. Now, although I don't... Uh, Follow their route. I can't help but admire the results of their faith. They are bringing Christians to the Lord, and they're not bringing charismatic movement. They're bringing them to the knowledge of the Savior. And I can tell I was honoring the Holy Spirit working through them. And I can't help but think that even though they may not have uh, theologically sound religion, the Lord is working through them. What do you say to that? I mean, no argument. <laughs> no argument. I believe there are many Christians who. Theologically may be defective, but are still genuine Christians, and they're going to grow. If their faith is real, they're going to grow, and many of them are. Yes? Um, in teaching in the Christian school classroom, um, in facing children that you think are saved as against children that you think are not saved, I have people ask me, well, don't you have to handle them and teach them differently? And uh, I wonder what you would say to this uh, in terms of uh, doctrine and discipline, and, but mostly doctrine. Some people are indicate that you should be trying to bring them to Christ to the point of view where when you get confessions and so on. Yeah. You know, I had, a, I had somebody say, well, 
I don't know how to start teaching or how to approach this person because I'm not sure whether it's safe. Well, I know there would be some who would very definitely disagree with me, but I believe we have to recognize that the school and the church are two different instruments of the Lord. And the purpose of the school is instruction, primarily, so that the school is not the place where you try to save people. So that I do not believe that the school is a place to try to evangelize children. Now, many of them will be by your teaching. Then, how do you deal with the children that are Christian and those who are obviously not Christian? They're put there because the parents want them in a good school. Exactly the same. Because you're not there to give individual treatment, but you are there to give a Christian education to all of them. They either take it or they leave. So that if they do not conform themselves to the discipline, then the thing to do is to tell them, hey, don't come back. But if they do, well and good. But you teach them exactly alike, exactly as you would teach any other Christian child. You give them the faith without any apologies. Now, what they do with it is not your concern. You've done your duty. So you don't make a distinction between them in the classroom. Yes. What justification does the church have today for ordaining women in the light of 1 Timothy 2, verse 12? None. None. It does so only because it looks to humanistic standards rather than scripture. However, there are people who are ready to say that the Bible doesn't mean what it says. Uh, there are some amazing books that have been written lately, one which claims the Bible is not against homosexuality. Now, uh, try to figure out how a seminary professor can write a book arguing that in the face of the obvious meaning of Scripture. It takes some real contortion. Then you have some that make a similar statement about women, that uh, Paul has no objection to the ordination of women. Well, uh, the scriptures are very clear. I said last night that uh, scripture nowhere says that women are inferior or not as intelligent. What it does say is that authority is given to the man. Now, in Proverbs 31, we have a very telling picture of the biblical view of woman. Her husband is an elder in the gates. That meant that he was a member of the town council or a judge. And what was she doing? She was carrying on the farm. She was carrying on the business. She was importing and exporting, she was very capable. Very definitely, in terms of the biblical perspective, a woman is a full-fledged teammate and a helpmate whose capacities are considered to be very, very remarkable indeed. So that she can carry on tremendous areas of activity while her husband functions in uh, a governmental office. So there's no downgrading of women. As a matter of fact, it was rationalism and the Enlightenment that degraded women.
treated them as though they were children and stripped them of legal powers. It definitely was not the picture prior to the rise of rationalism in the 18th century. Yes. Helping communist causes, yes. Of course, I think it's a mark of a lack of common sense at the very least to apostasy because very definitely many seem to feel that salvation is going to come to the world not through Christ but through Marxist-type revolutions. We have a formal theology that advocates it, liberation theology, and it has made very heavy inroads into all kinds of circles, including evangelical seminaries. Uh, the sad fact is that there is one theologian who is quite highly regarded in evangelical circles who's gone so far as to make a statement that I think is the height of stupidity. He has said the words of the prophets are today written on the subway walls. Now that takes an incredible a stupidity to make a statement like that. I wonder what, when was the last time he went into a subway. But uh, you see, this is their temper. They're ready to look to anything in the world as a standard. And they've created other gospels which are totally alien to Scripture. I recently read through to give a series of lectures at a seminary, and I won't be asked back again, I'm reasonably sure, on liberation theology. And I had read a little before, but I was really appalled at the kind of thing young ministers are being asked to read. It really is another gospel. Yes. Uh, we were asked to help out with the World Council of Churches are, are defending someone that has probably been put into prison for her communist ideas, and then the church gives money to put her defense. Well, how can the average layman help prevent our church when our leaders go ahead and do things like that? How can we? Yes, how can we, as members, prevent or what can we do when our churchmen cooperate with the World Council of Churches in revolutionary activities? Not an easy question to answer. and It's very difficult to know what can be done. Certainly, uh, the World Council has been the sponsor and the origin of this liberation theology. So what they're doing in that area is really to work for world revolution. So their activities are diametrically opposed to what the missionaries we send out are doing. Uh, what we can do is to strengthen a faithful church. Then if there are new seminaries that are being created, that are faithful, we need to strengthen those seminaries. One thing is sure. These people are killing churches so that the churches that represent that type of modernist faith are dying all over the country. What they want is for people like you to go on financing them because they can't exist without you. I know the Southern Presbyterian Church had a division recently. Now, there's still some very serious problems with the new group, but one thing was clear. The new group, the PCA, took only one-twentieth of the membership of the old church. That one-twentieth was 40% of the giving. This tells you what the faithful 
do. So you do have power. Not only because you are the believers, and it's your prayers the Lord will hear, but it's also your giving which keeps the church alive. Now be wise stewards of what you have. Yes? The two part question. All right. Uh, what is dispensationalism and uh, would you consider it a Christian heresy? What is dispensationalism and would I consider it a Christian heresy? Dispensationalism has its classic form in the notes to the Schofield Bible. Dispensationalism is something that was born in the middle of the last century. It gained a tremendous impetus, as I indicated, I believe, the other night, with the rise of Darwinism. Dispensationalism says, in effect, that God's various dispensations offer from a different plan of salvation to a different way of dealing with mankind. So in a sense, it posits an evolution within God's being. It also wrongly divides the word of God so that strict dispensationalists have a, a smaller Bible than actually the, do the modernists because the Old Testament is no longer valid for this dispensation, the book of Matthew is not, and a good deal of Mark and Luke is not, and most of Paul's epistles are not, and you cannot use the Lord's Prayer because that belongs to the kingdom age, and so on. So that with some of the strict dispensational pastors I have known, it didn't seem to me that there was more than about 20 pages of the Bible that uh, were still valid. Now that, to me, is on the same level as modernism. It's another way of saying you don't believe in most of the Bible while pretending to believe in it from cover to cover. What they do is to say they believe in the Bible from cover to cover, but not much between the covers. Now, I do believe it is a Christian heresy, very definitely, because it is a wrong form of thinking, and it does greatly weaken and enervate the church. For one thing, dispensationalism tends to be very cynical about the church and see very little use for the church. It tends strongly to create an individual faith or little groups and circles and churches which are just concerned with bringing people into this special truth. There is no sense of the whole counsel of God. Yes. Okay, in Second Timothy, referring to the verse that George referred to about uh, women keeping silent, and church, I know they, they're not going for women preachers, but how far do they extend it? Do they, does that go into Sunday school teachers, women voting in the church on church matters? I don't understand how yes. to draw the line. All right. A good question. What is the place of women in the church, and how strictly do we draw the line? Now, a text without a context is a pretext. <laughs> so we have to understand what was the situation in the early church. Now, Paul meant this for all time because very definitely he goes on to say it has something to do with the way God made man and woman. He deals with it in Corinthians but it also deals with a particular place and a problem, all right? Let's imagine now that we are an early church meeting in Rome or Corinth or Samaria or Jerusalem. What would our church be like? Well, first, for the, a couple of centuries or more, there were no church buildings. 
we would be meeting in homes. The homes we would meet in would be the homes of members who had fair-sized rooms. This is why Priscilla and Aquila, who had homes in three cities, were prosperous business people. Their homes were churches. They could accommodate people. Now, in times of persecution, even that would break up so that in a time of persecution, it would be dangerous for too many people to get together in one home. It would attract attention. So you would meet perhaps 10 or 15 in a home and no more, which they're doing again in Red China. But let us assume it was a time of relative peace between persecutions, and we had 50 or 60 in a home. How would the service be conducted? Well, first of all, in that meeting there would be a number of people who were not Christians. Why? Even in persecution, the early church was very aggressive in going out and bringing in people. The first persecution, or the first martyrdom that we have an eyewitness account of is of two girls. They were young women, newly married, and both pregnant. One had delivered a baby. And both, when they were still pregnant, had become quite concerned. What a horrible word, world to bring up a baby in. The philosophy of the time, the religion of the time, seemed suddenly unspeakable to them. Where can we find some truth, some decency, something in this world that will make life worth living, worth bringing a baby up in? Now that's how they tended to think. So, Young mothers and young fathers, young couples, very often would be the best prospects. Well, we find these two young women brought in, and they're caught when the meeting is raided. They're taken to prison. One had already given birth to her child previously, and they're martyred. But now, let's assume that in these meetings, people come in. The early church would begin and its service would be exactly like ours with one difference. It would be like our meeting tonight and that after the pastor spoke there would be questions. Questions from the congregation so they might be instructed more. Paul says he forbids the woman to speak. Why? Well, I can tell you why from experience. Now, when I go across the country, I very often speak on, at a college or a university campus, secular state institutions or private institutions. The worst questions of all come from women or girls who don't like what I have to say. Why? Well, they know instinctively that a man is going to be a gentleman and courteous in answering them, or else everybody's going to think he's a stinker. And so, they become so obnoxious and insulting that you, you can't imagine some of the things they'll say. They'll get very argumentative. In fact, I had... At one university, it was in Wisconsin, a woman a faculty member get up and scream at me and hurl all kinds of foul insults at me. I just had to take it. If it had been a man on the faculty, I could have ticked him off. But a woman, you see, everyone there would have thought badly of me. Now, this is the kind of thing that Paul was dealing with. And he said, I forbid the women to speak. 
Don't you ask questions of the pastor or challenge him or argue with him. You keep quiet. If there's something you don't understand, you ask your husband and let him ask or let him explain it to you at home. Now do you understand why Paul was saying what he was? Now that's a little different from a meeting like this, you see, where a godly woman raises a question. But even then, you see, there's always that problem because a woman's weapons are the weapons of weakness and she can exploit them so that as anyone who speaks in hostile atmosphere knows the most dangerous heckler or questioner can be a girl or a woman she'll take advantage of her sex does that help explain it so Paul is saying, yes, women do not have the authority. They're not to preach. They're not to take leadership over men. This doesn't mean that they can't lead in Sunday school or in women's meetings. But in a, in a meeting, I was going to wander over here, and there's a little platform here. <laughs> Obviously, Pastor Conradson is not given to wandering. <laughs> but Paul did say in these meetings where you had that kind of situation he, the women were not to speak and I think it's still a valid rule and I wish it applied at university campuses <laughs> What? I give you no Surely. At our district convention about uh, eight or four years ago, we lost 300 pastoral delegates, 300 lay delegates. And they, uh, I still can't figure out by what devious means they set up some of these things, but <laughs> they, they had two interest forums. Speakers, one a state legislator, one got this man in Sacramento, who was promoting a lottery, state lottery. Fong mm. and Senator Fong. And the other was a gal that the uh, young lady was pregnant. Typical 45 year old PhD with a European accent. <laughs> Probably had two or three husbands. Mm -hmm. None at the time. Anyway, <laughs> she was a career player. So the senator gave this five minute pitch on why we should have a state lottery. She gave a five minute pitch on why we should have unlimited abortions. Then they divided us into two groups 300 pastors, 300 lay dogs. Each team spoke to each group and then they switched. And uh, I got a front row seat from this gal's to give us a pitch on board with 300 pastors. And she ended up by saying, oh, it's so funny business, but I want to get my own straight. And uh, I'm not a gentleman. And right in front of the row, I shouted loudly enough so everybody could hear. Then why are you telling 300 people about it in public? <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more questions?